Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 7 and 16 through 20. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a wonderful passage. The Gospel of Matthew ties Easter to the mission Jesus entrusts to his people. The story of Jesus' resurrection from the dead leads right into Jesus telling us what we're to be giving our lives for and to until he returns. The resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus, those two great moments in history have between them the mission that's been entrusted to us to tell everyone the power of his name. If you're new with us today, we're in the middle of a series looking at the Easter accounts in each of the Gospels. And we turn today, finally, it's the last one in this series, to Matthew chapter 28. And we read again of the amazement, the astonishment of people as they encounter Jesus raised from the dead. But Jesus gives very specific instructions here to the women at the tomb, and he says, quickly now, go tell my disciples. And when they go, they give him this instruction. We want, Jesus wants to meet you at this particular mountain, and there he's got words for you. Now these are, and I want you to hear this, the last words of Jesus until he comes back. The last words of Jesus. You know, when somebody gives you their final words. Those are words you lean into. Those are words you you hang the rest of your life on. The last words. The last thing that Jesus told his people was this. I'm with you. I'm going to be with you all the way to the end. But you are a going people. You are a people on the move. And I want you to take my message to everyone you know, every place in the world. These are the last words of Jesus until he returns. And those words that were spoken on that day to those people gathered on that mountain with all of their worship and all of their doubts. It says they worshiped and some were doubting. But in all of, all of their experience, those last words of Jesus that were given that day are the same words that are given to us. And what Jesus says in that moment is, this is not about you. Those are the last words of Jesus. Can I give you the five first words of a dying church? What's in it for me? What's in it for us? Too often, we use a consumeristic grid for our evaluation of what a good church is. But let me just give you this one characteristic about a church which is vital in terms of Jesus' last words. It's not about us. It's about everyone else. Uh, It's been said that the church is the one society on the earth that exists for the benefit of its non-members. You and I are actually not called to ask what's in it for us, but rather to realize what's been given to us 
and then to take that into the whole world. And because Jesus has been raised from the dead, and the impact of his words, he turned the whole world into the Holy Land. The whole world into the Holy Land. And he turned the whole human race into his chosen people. His message was very simple. Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, when you and I hear the term nations, when you and I hear that term, we tend to think lines on a map, geopolitical states with boundaries and passports and visas and governments. And while the term can be used that way at times in the Bible, this word that's used here, ethnos, it just means all those people who are outside of Israel, all the nations, all the Gentiles, all the people who are not part of, for these people who first heard Jesus, their experience. Because in the middle of Matthew's gospel, Jesus said, I'm sending you out to all of the lost sheep of the house of Israel don't go to the Gentiles. How many of you are glad don't go to the Gentiles were not Jesus' last words? But in the middle of Matthew, that's what he tells them. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the nations. Don't go. Go here. Very limited scope of mission. But then when you get to the end, Jesus takes the boundaries of their, their mission and he expands it out. And he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And in my name, go to the Gentiles. Go to all of the people who are outside the boundaries of your experience. What Jesus did is this. He turned the world upside down by turning his people inside out. He's still doing that. Jesus turned the world upside down by turning his people inside out. What had happened in Israel's story is that God was their God, but God who was their God, they began to believe was no one else's God. That because they were a priestly people who'd been given the task of showing to the nations his wisdom and his commandments, they began to interpret their relationship with God as something around which to build walls, uh, something which was simply in need of preservation rather than something which was in need of expansion. This is something that Jesus broke wide open. He broke down the barriers that existed about dietary restrictions between Jews and Gentiles. He broke down all of the barriers that existed racially, socioeconomically, even in gender. He broke it all down. It was an unheard of advance. It was the most radical moment in the history of the ancient world. When Jesus was raised from the dead, everything that had fragmented humanity, everything that had broken us apart was beginning to be healed. Everything that had once been separated was being brought together in Jesus. And Jesus said, that's why you have to take my name to everyone. There was a morning that the sun rose over a world where no one had ever heard the name of Jesus. By A.D. 25, there were only a few people who had ever heard the name of Jesus. A few people in a tiny village called Nazareth. By A.D. 30, there wasn't hardly anyone in Israel who hadn't heard of Jesus. The, are you the only one who hasn't heard of Jesus? The two disciples on the road to Emmaus said to the stranger who walked with him. Everybody knew who he was in Israel. By by A.D. 50, there were riots in Rome surrounding his name and the controversy that was stirred by him. By A.D. 64, the emperor himself was persecuting the followers of Jesus. They were growing in number so very much they posed a threat and an easy target for blame shifting. 
Within 250 years, that entire empire would be converted to his name. And now, 2,000 years later, this tiny group of disciples you read about in the text this morning, this little group of people who met in Galilee on the mountain, that little group of people have become the largest community of faith in the world. And advances in literature and science and technology and advances in artistry, whether poetry or story or music, even, even the invention of musical notation, all of that has flowed from this moment in this text. These words changed the world. And these words can change our worlds still. And they need to. Because we have to stop asking, what's in it for me? We have to stop it. Jesus still wants to turn us inside out. And when that happens, it's very disturbing. It's disturbing because people down through the ages have given their lives so that other people could know about Jesus in ways that most people would count as a waste of life. Jim Elliott, the famous missionary to Ecuador, was killed and cannibalized by these people. He famously said before he went on that mission, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He wasn't the only one killed and cannibalized. The other members of his team were too. The wives of those men, as you know, many of you know, the wives of those men, rather than spending the rest of their lives in bitterness and anger and anguish, they went to the same people who had killed and cannibalized their husbands and they led them to Christ. That's the heartbeat of the Great Commission. That no matter what it cost us, the last words of Jesus would defeat the first five words of a dying church. It's not about what's in it for me, it's about what's in it for him. It's the glory of his name in all the world. That's his intention. I'm going to mess with the people on the screen things right now, so be patient with them. Guys, can you put back up the call to worship? Can we get all the way back there? Can I mess with you and do that? I want to explain this to you. Because this part of the story is so important. There was a, a man named Robert Thomas. He was from Wales. Robert Thomas had a burden for the people of Korea. He was a young man. He was in his mid-20s. And he felt God had called him. And so he went, ultimately, first to China, then to Korea. Korea was a closed peninsula. It was a place where no missionaries were welcome. No one wanted them there. And as he went from a ship up onto the shore, up onto the beach, he was offering out Bibles. They met him on the shore, and they killed him. And they sliced off his head. And he fell. Dead. One of the men who was responsible for his death took the Bible and ripped it open and used it to wallpaper his house. Neighbors were fascinated by that. And they came over to read his wallpaper. And within 10 years, that city was full of churches. That's how the gospel came to Korea. How many 20-year-olds would have that vision? How many moms hearing about the death of their son would have said that price was worth paying? But that's what Christians have done all through the years. Let's do the call to worship again because most of you weren't here when we did it anyway, but that's a different issue. <laughs> Just saying. That's your moment of guilt manipulation from the pastor this morning. <laughs> Just as I... Okay, no, no. You who fear the Lord, give him praise. Let all who stand in awe of him 
give Him glory. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and He rules over the nations. There's a reference at the bottom of that. What reference is it? Psalm 22. Do you know how Psalm 22 begins? You do. You do. It begins with these words. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The words of the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Jesus cried from the cross. These are the words of the cross. But the song of the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The words of agony that flow from Jesus' lips on the cross lead by the end of the song to this reality. All the families of the nations will come and worship. Jesus died on the cross. He suffered that agony. Not so just a few could be converted, but so that the whole world should give God glory. Evangelism exists where worship doesn't. And it will continue to exist until the earth is full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Jesus died on the cross to receive the nations as his inheritance. And the Holy Ghost will not stop working in the world through feeble people like us until the passion of Jesus on the cross is met by the mission of the church in the world. And all those who are called by grace have been brought into the harvest. That's a good chance to say amen. Why be involved in the Great Commission? Because Christ, when he died on the cross, had that in mind. And maybe it happens through a medical mission or a mercy mission or Bible pages turned into wallpaper. But the truth of the matter is that everyone that you think right now is an outsider is invited by Jesus into the kingdom. And that means it's not just every person out there because it's easy to romanticize this and go, yeah, well, I'm not called to Korea. Korea, which is now the country which sends more missionaries than any other country in the world. That young Welshman laid down his life and they turned his Bibles into wallpaper. That's now the place that sends more missionaries than any other country in the world. Wow. But it's not just international, you see, it's generational. Here on Mother's Day, let me remind you of Paul's words to Timothy. He said, I'm mindful, he wrote to Timothy, of the faith that was in your grandmother and the faith that was in your mother and which I know now lives in you, grandmothers and mothers and sons and daughters. Because my friends, the church is only ever one generation from extinction. It's not just every nation that is to be discipled, but every generation which is to be discipled. This is why Paul then writes to Timothy, he says, the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There are four spiritual generations in that verse. Paul, Timothy, the faithful men, and the others also. In other words, this faith has to be passed down through the generations. And that means every single one of us, every single one of us are a sent people. You don't have to move overseas to fulfill the Great Commission. You just have to get up in the morning and pray with your kids. But it's not just your kids. You don't only have to not go overseas, you just have to go across the street. I'm always amazed that we will spend millions of dollars in the Church of Jesus Christ to send people across oceans to talk to people about Jesus that we would shun if they were our neighbors. Oh, they're Muslims. Oh, they're Hindu. Oh, they're black. Or they're whatever. 
But let's raise money and send somebody over there. But pray God, they don't come here. <laughs> what if God just decided to save you the money and he decided to just bring them all here? And now they're your neighbors. And now you don't even have to buy an airfare. Now all you got to do is bake a pie. <laughs> My friends, Jesus turned the world upside down by turning his people inside out. I don't know if we'll hear him. I don't know if we'll really be gripped by it. I don't know. It's not always that the church always has. I've told you some of the good stuff, but let me remind you of the bad stuff. In 1266, Kubla Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, was deeply impressed by the Christian faith he saw in a man named Marco Polo. And he asked him to go back to Europe and send for a hundred pastors to come to the court of the Chinese Empire, the Mongolian Empire there, and teach Christianity. And so the call went back, and the Pope issued the call for missionaries to come. You know how many people responded? Two. Two. And they turned around and went back because the weather got bad. The weather. By the time the Christian teachers that Kublai Khan had asked for actually arrived in 1294, he was dead. And the Mongol Empire had converted to Tibetan Buddhism instead. Can you imagine how different history might have been if China in the 1200s had converted to Christianity? Of course, God's not slow concerning his promise, and one of the fastest growing churches in the world right now is in China, and they're going to be missionary people. They're going to be sending people all over the world. One of, the day, one of these days, the walls are going to come down in China. China, a church which has been severely persecuted since the, the days of Mao, terrible ordeals of suffering, terrible martyrdom, but they're going to go. That's one. There are more Christians today in China than there are people in the United States. And one of these days, the walls are going to come down. And those people are going to be going to places like Iran and Saudi Arabia. They're going to go into all of these places that right now probably you and I can't go. And imagine it for just a moment. If somebody comes up to um, a Chinese believer and says, you know, if you go there, they might kill you. A Chinese Christian is going to say what? And? You and I have been given this incredible treasure. And here's the thing. There isn't a single one of us who don't have the power as well to carry it out. Because the last part of the commission is so important. It's not just, I have all authority in heaven and earth, disciple all nations and all generations, it's this. I am with you always, even to the end. I am with you. Would you say it with me? I am with you. You know, don't miss the I am. I am. I am. Nobody said those words in Israel. Nobody said, I am. Why? That's God's name. But Jesus did. You know why? Because he's God. I am. That's why they were worshiping. Don't miss that part of the verse. It says they were worshiping. They worshiped him. Every single part of that sentence is antithetical to every part of their upbringing. They worshiped him. They were worshiping the resurrected Savior, the God-man right in front of them. And Jesus, of course, in the beginning of Matthew's gospel is introduced to us as, here's the name, Emmanuel, which means, say it with me, God with us. God with us at his birth is God with us 
in the resurrection and great commission. Matthew begins by saying Jesus is God with us, and Jesus ends the story by saying, I'm God, and I'm with you. There is no one in this room who's a follower of Jesus with all of our worship and all of our doubts. There's no one in this room that God can't use to bring the good news of Jesus to people who desperately need to know. We just need to know that he's with us. And it will change us. It'll mess with you. If you know that God's with you, it will turn you inside out in love for the people who are around you. I don't know what it's going to look like. Imagine for a moment if we made a decision as a church, we decided this. Uh, We're going to all dress up in military fatigues. And we're going to take the worship team and we're going to march down the streets of Franklin all dressed in military uniform shouting praise and worship choruses and handing out Bibles to everybody we meet. And we're especially going to march up into Nashville and we're going to find every homeless person we can and every drunkard we can and we're, we're, going, to, we're, going, to, we're really going after those guys. How's that for church growth strategy? Every member of the church has to dress up in a military uniform. You go, man, that's crazy. Yeah, it's already been done. It's called the Salvation Army. Now, you may think they look kind of cute in those uniforms. But the truth of the matter is that when that first started, that was as radical as it could get. I love the Salvation Army. Blood and fire. That's their motto. Blood and fire. We're a little more tame. (laughs) Worship one and love all. Christ Community Church. It'd be interesting, wouldn't it, just to change our motto for a couple of weeks? Blood and fire. (laughs) Their great hymn, O God of burning, cleansing flames, send the fire. The blood-bought gift today we claim, send the fire today. Look down and see this waiting host and send the promised Holy Ghost. We need another Pentecost. Send the fire today. They'd sing that and then they'd go for a march. My friends, The Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, God with you. He's the power, not you. He'll give you the words. He'll give you the prayers. He'll give you the ability to love people you find hard to love. And you can pass the faith to other people. My friends, nothing's changed in 2,000 years except except this. In America... Here in the epicenter of the evangelical industrial complex, we keep asking, what's in it for me? To hell with that. We have to start asking, what's in it for him? What's in it for him? And here's why. Because the greatest missionary of all was Jesus. He came from heaven. He went to the cross and he died for you, and he rose for you, and he will come again for you. And he calls you and me to participate in his mission. What a privilege. Let's pray. Lord, help us to join you in your mission, to stop asking what's in it for us, and to start asking what's in it for you. Turn us inside out so that once again you can turn the world upside down. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to confess our faith together using a question from the Heidelberg Catechism. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death so that he might make us share in the righteousness he obtained for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are already raised to new life. Christ's resurrection is a sure pledge to us of our blessed resurrection. Amen. Beloved, you heard Tim's report this morning uh, to give and honor God from the first fruits. Let's do that today in our giving. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, receive the gifts and the offerings we make this day. Sanctify them for your name. We do pray, Lord, and lift up to you all those things that Tim brought to our attention today. We believe you will supply for all that is commissioned by you, uh, deliver us from asking what's in it for us 
and teach us to remember you've given us all things for the glory of your name. And help us to offer to you the fruit of our labor and not just the fruit of our lips. All these things we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's be seated and continue to worship God in our, with our giving this morning. Let's come to the Lord's table together and uh, celebrate the great love that Jesus has bestowed on us in making us his children. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast, the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. My beloved friends, this morning, if you are baptized, as the Great Commission says, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you have set your heart on pilgrimage with Jesus, and you know you need to come again to the foot of the cross, then I invite you to come to the table of the Lord. Because on the night in which he was betrayed, our Savior took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body which is for you. In the same way after supper he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it all of you. And this do, Jesus said, in remembrance of me. Beloved, this table is not a reward for your righteousness. It's the food for your needy soul. Come, all you who are hungry and thirsty. Come all you who know you need Jesus, just as you are, without one plea, but that his blood was shed for thee. Come to the Lamb of God. I want to ask all those brothers and sisters who are serving at the various tables to come to your places, and as they do, let's pray. We set aside now this bread and this wine from common use unto sacred purpose. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O Lord, on these gifts and these your people that we by faith in the power of the resurrected Savior might have true communion in the body and blood of Jesus. We thank you for this now. Amen. Brothers and sisters, come to the Lord's table. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning for our benediction? It is from Matthew 28. After we're going to sing together uh, a song with a message that we want everyone to know that God is a good, good father. They've heard the wrong story in so many cases. Our job is to tell them the right story and that they can be his beloved children too. And because this is true, go therefore and make disciples of all nations and every generation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, says Jesus, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's sing and rejoice.